question to ask who takes care of cancer patients. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium and then also uh, please remember to fill out the program evaluations and uh, if you have uh, any uh, recommendations uh, for the CME committee in regards to future topics or future speakers, we would be very appreciative. Uh, we have uh, two presenters today. Um, our presenters are uh, Dr. Stephanie Fabian and uh, Dr. Jordan Rulo. Dr. Fabian completed her residence in internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Texas and now is a consultant in the Division of General in Internal Medicine and Preventative Occupational Medicine at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, she is also assistant professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. Uh, she is currently the director of the Women's Health Clinic at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, our other presenter, Dr. Jordan Rulo, received a PhD in psychology from the University of Utah and is now a senior associate consultant in the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology and the Department of Internal Medicine at the Mayo Clinic and she's assistant professor of uh, psychology at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and they uh, have uh, kindly driven down from Rochester today to review with us uh, sexual health and menopause concerns helping cancer survivors and their quality of life and please jo uh, well, uh, join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, great. So again, I'm Stephanie Fabian. This is Dr. Jordan Rulo, and we're gonna give this talk in combined format. So we're gonna each talk a little bit during it because this is how we work in our clinic together. Um, we practice in a women's health clinic and we do a combination of, it's all consultative. We don't do any primary care. And we do menopause consults, hormonal concerns, and sexual health consults. Um, so that brings us here today, and we're going to be talking about sexual health concerns and menopause concerns and helping cancer survivors with their quality of life. So I'm going to let Dr. Rulo start this talk, and um, we'll interact in a way that will helpfully, hopefully give you some idea of how we interact in our clinic as well. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for having us here today. Uh, so we're going to be talking about sexual health and menopause concerns, helping cancer survivors with their quality of life. We do not have any financial disclosures. Uh, so let me ask, uh, before starting this talk, because you probably want to know, like, why should I even be listening? Um, I'm curious, how many of you with a raise of hands have cared for uh, someone struggling with cancer or a cancer survivor? Raise your hands. All right, so pretty much everyone. This is great. So this is exactly what we're going to be talking about, how to care for, especially when it comes to menopause and sexual health-related concerns, these patients. Sarah, I can't sleep. I have hot flashes all night and wake up soaking the bed with sweat. This is awful. So Sarah is a 42-year-old heterosexual married woman with ovarian cancer, status post-total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. That is quite a mouthful. Kelly, I can't even look at my breasts, let alone let my husband look. I haven't let him touch me since my surgery. Kelly's a 46-year-old heterosexual married woman, stage two breast cancer, status post bilateral mastectomy. We're gonna talk in detail about Kelly and Sarah, and uh, these are patients who came to our clinic and how we help them. The learning objectives for today's talk, review sexual health concerns of cancer survivors, explain how to evaluate sexual health concerns in cancer survivors, describe the treatments for cancer-related sexual health concerns, and then list treatments for menopause in the setting of cancer. So is sexual health important in cancer survivors? I mean, they're, they're struggling with cancer. They've just survived cancer. Maybe they're not, sex is even on their radar of something to think about. It is important. Okay, so the National Cancer Care Network says yes. This is important, and they have guidelines around sexual health and cancer survivors. So their guidelines say ask. Ask about sexual function at regular intervals. Use uh, the brief symptom, sexual symptom checklist as a primary screening tool, and we'll show you that checklist in a little bit. Review present and past sexual, sexual activity and sexual concerns. Discuss how their cancer treatment has affected their sexual functioning and intimacy, and then make sure to discuss treatment-associated infertility if indicated with appropriate referrals. So the National Cancer Care Network says this is important. Cancer and sexual health. So let's look at a few different cancers and see how sexual health impacts these cancers. So head and neck, I'm gonna throw this out to all of you. What percentage of patients, uh, survivors of head and neck cancer, report sexual health concerns? Throw out a percentage. What was that, 70? 
70-ish, okay? Anything else? Anyone else? 10, 10% 10 to 70%. Okay, good. So we've got some disagreement here. So head and neck, according to a few different studies, anywhere between 36 and 58%. So this could be half of the patients you see with head and neck cancers are reporting sexual health concerns. All right, breast cancer, what number? What do you all think? 90. Okay, are you ready? Between 70 and 100% based on the studies that we looked at of breast cancer patients are reporting sexual health concerns. Prostate cancer, what do you all think? 15, 90, 95, between 24 and 82%. Pelvic cancer, throw out some numbers. 75, well, we'll just go with 75 between 50 and 94%. Um, so bottom line, these are not small numbers. Uh, these multiple different cancers, patients in large numbers are reporting sexual health concerns. Oh, we got cervical cancer too. What number would you say for that? Oh, I hear three, 100, between 30 and 63%, big numbers. If you are seeing these patients, you need to be asking about their sexual health. If you take anything away from this talk, one of the main things we want you to take away is that cancer does not take away your sexuality. Uh, these cancer survivors are going through a lot and their sexuality is still an important part of their quality of life. It's important when you're talking about, when you're talking with them about their overall quality of life to not forget the sexual health piece. Okay, so let's go back to Sarah. I can't sleep, I have hot flashes all night, wake up soaking the bed with sweat, this is awful. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Fabian who's gonna tell you a little bit more on how we treated Sarah. Okay, so we're gonna talk about sexual health and gynecologic cancers. You know, these women have so many things that can possibly affect their sexual functioning and we're just gonna go through a, a few of them, but talk, think about surgery. Um, surgery, for Sarah, and she had ovarian cancer, so she's gonna have her ovaries removed, so that's gonna put her in a premature menopause, not gradually, but overnight, literally. So it's a sudden onset. The vasomotor symptoms, the hot flashes of the night sweats, are often particularly severe because when you have your ovaries removed, you're not only losing estrogen, but you're losing all the other ovarian hormones too, including progesterone and testosterone, which can impact vasomotor symptoms. Genitourinary syndrome of menopause is the new term for vulvovaginal atrophy. And they changed the term in the last year to primarily reflect that this entity or loss of hormones can affect not only the vagina, but also the urinary tract as well. And putting these women into a sudden and premature menopause can certainly impact vaginal health. Loss of fertility. So for many women with ovarian cancer, this is striking women in their younger years. They're often still fertile, and this is often a blow in terms of the loss of fertility and it needs to be dealt with. And then the physical changes. Think about just what the surgery did. There's gonna be neurovascular disruption, scarring. There may be bowel resections, ostomies, stomas. There may be an entire exoneration. So the surgery can be quite significant and can have an impact itself. Radiation therapy can cause vaginal changes. It can cause stenosis, shortening and narrowing of the vagina. And even the vulvar skin can become fibrotic with radiation. Chemotherapy, so if a woman isn't in menopause already with any type of surgery, chemotherapy can also cause pre premature ovarian insufficiency. And then think about the psychological impact for these patients. They have alterations in self-image, they may have depression, and they may have health-related anxieties as a result of what they've been through for cancer treatment. So let's go back to Sarah. So when we talk to her, her chief complaints are, I get these waves of heat. I soak the bed at night from sweat, and it hurts to wipe when I urinate. So how are you gonna ask her about sexual health? She really didn't tell you anything about sexual health then, so how, how do you do this? I mean, what do you say? So you pick one question, and you can just have this one question in your, in your back pocket, and you can use it with all your patients. Like, do you have any sexual health concerns? That's open-ended, it lets them answer the question. And trust me, if you, if you go so far as to show that you're really willing to talk about this, many of your patients will go ahead and say, you know what, yeah, I really do. Do you have any concerns or questions about sexual functioning? So just pick an easy question that you can have in your back pocket. 
also ask routinely. So as Sarah, we just saw Sarah didn't bring up a sexual health concern on her own. We really had to ask her about it for it to come out. But if there are no concerns that the, fir the first time you ask, you talk about the treatment that you're giving or the treatment that they're receiving, and you say, well, here are the things that can happen, and let me know if they do, but make sure you bring it up at every single visit that they, they come back for. So that brief symptom checklist, that NCCN uh, checklist that was suggested, it's really simple. It's five questions. You can have this in your office. You can have patients fill it out ahead of time. But it starts with, are you satisfied with your sexual functioning? And if not, how long have you been dissatisfied? And three is, what, what is the problem? Is it an interest problem? Is it a genital sensation problem? Is there problems with vaginal dryness? Do you have trouble reaching orgasm? Is there pain or is it something else? And which is the most bothersome problem? And would you like to talk about it with your doctor? So it's a really simple checklist. So back to Sarah again. We asked, do you have any sexual health concerns? And she said, well, it's too painful to have sex. And you might have guessed that because she said she was having pain when she even wiped after urination. She said, I don't have any interest in sex whatsoever. So when we think about what we're going to do for Sarah, we're thinking about she might benefit from some hormone therapy for vasomotor symptom management. So that was one of the big concerns that she had. We also need to think that she went through a premature menopause before the natural age of menopause. She's only 42 years of age, and that means that there are concerns about her bone health, her brain health, her heart health, if she doesn't get estrogen until that natural age of menopause. So even if she weren't having vasomotor symptoms, we would really still think about, does this woman need some hormone therapy to protect her long term? Then we get to the management of the vaginal dryness and the sexual pain. So we've got to make sure that our treatment includes uh, these issues to address as well. She's also complaining of low sexual desire. So let's talk about the hormone therapy part first. So when we talk about hormone therapy and cancer survivors, it, providers get a little... Um, they get a little antsy about using hormone therapy with some hi cancer histories, and it's um, important to go through and understand exactly which cancers you can use some hormone therapy with after and which you really shouldn't. So it's okay for some and not for others. For ovarian cancer history, there's really no evidence suggesting that hormone therapy increases risk of recurrence or decreases survival, and the possible ex exception there would be a granulosa cell tumor. For endometrial cancer, it's generally the literature would point that it's probably okay in early stage disease. Uh, the exception would be sarcomas. There's very little data in the later stage disease, the stage three and stage four. Um, and while there isn't data to suggest it's harmful, there's just not a lot of data there. But for the early stage cancer, it's probably okay with the exception of sarcomas. Cervical, vaginal, and vulvar cancers are not hormone dependent. These are largely HPV related, and hormone therapy is okay to use for these guys. Breast cancer, we typically avoid systemic hormone therapy as there's evidence that hormone therapy can increase risk of recurrence. So when we go back to Sarah, she had an epithelial ovarian cancer, and systemic estrogen use is probably okay and may be particularly important given that she's under 45 years of age. And we know that th these women, again, are at risk for long-term health consequences that are not so great, including adverse effects on bone, brain, and heart. She also may need some local vaginal estrogen therapy because we know that systemic hormone therapy may not be enough to cover the vaginal tissues, and up to 10 to 20% of women on systemic hormone therapy still need vaginal estrogen in addition to the systemic hormone therapy. So when we go back to Sarah, let's talk about management of vaginal dryness and the sexual pain piece. Genitourinary syndrome of menopause, as we're now calling VVA, signs thinning of the vulvar and vaginal tissues. Those tissues are less elastic. There's less vaginal moisture and lubrication. The symptoms that the patient may be reporting to you are dryness, burning, itching, and dyspareunia. And uh, we just shared a patient this week who uh, was in my office complaining of uh, she couldn't sit. She's a breast cancer survivor, and uh, they were planning a trip around the country for a band, uh, high school students. Um, they were supposed to travel 5,000 miles, and she was about to cancel her trip because she literally could not sit down because of vaginal dryness. 
So when we talk about non-hormonal treatments of genitourinary syndrome of menopause, or formerly VBA, you need to know the difference between lubricants and moisturizers to talk about this with your patients. And just have a couple of names of lubricants in your back pocket to be able to rattle off to your patients. So you need to know a couple of water-based names and a couple of silicone-based names. But lubricants are for use with sexual activity. So you would pick a, wa a water-based is a good general lubricant. A silicone-based is a little longer lasting. Um, it, it will last through a sexual activity. It's a little slicker, too. Um, but you need to be careful if the partner has some erectile dysfunction. It may actually be too slippery. In that case, we'd recommend a water base. Now, water base will dry out a little bit faster. You may have to reapply during sexual activity or simply just moisten your fingers and it'll reactivate. But have a couple of names. Moisturizers, on the other hand, are used to maintain vaginal moisture, and you use those every day or every other day on a regular basis. And the most common uh, moisturizer worldwide is Replens. It's a bioadhesive, so it actually irreversibly binds to vaginal cells and holds in water. So when those vaginal cells slough every two or three days, it will slough off as well, and that's why you have to reapply it on a regular basis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So lifestyle modifications are also important. Um, sexual activity actually helps maintain vaginal health, but we have to emphasize that this should be painless sexual activity. It um, is counterproductive for it to be painful, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, the use of vibrators can also be helpful, and smoking cessation as well. So when we talk about vaginal estrogen therapy, here are the options available in the United States, and you guys are probably well aware of these, but there are two different brands of estrogen cream. There's estrace and premarin. There's a vaginal ring, which is the estrin ring, and the vaginal tablet, which is Vagifem. Now, unfortunately, none of these is generic yet, and all of them are quite expensive. So finding out which is covered by your patient's insurance is an important part of this. So treatment for sexual pain. And I'll turn this over to Dr. Rulo. And I just realized since I'm on the lavalier, like, I could walk around. around. I could come in the audience. We could do this Oprah style. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to, but maybe I will walk a little bit over here just for fun. I usually don't do this, so it's like a little scary. Yeah. Do you need to do a dance? Okay. Yeah. Treatment for sexual pain. Um, so physical therapy is really, really helpful for sexual pain because one part of sexual pain is that more deep sexual pain related to those tight or tense pelvic floor muscles. So typically women with genitourinary syndrome of menopause, vulvovaginal atrophy, they'll report those tight muscles. Women who have gone through surgery for cancer, radiation to the pelvis, those pelvic floor muscles get really tight and cause pain during sexual activity. So physical therapists will actually go and do trigger point release uh, manually, internally, to calm those muscles down. Sex therapy is also really helpful for treatment for, for sexual pain. So let me talk more about that. Um, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes, actually, but let me give you kind of a brief synopsis of, of why it's important. So think about it. Um, think about if every time you had sex, there was pain. So sex, pain, sex, pain, sex, pain. <laughs> sex and pain get paired together. And they get paired together in two places. So they get paired together in your mind. When you even think about sex, what do you think is the first thing you think of? Pain, exactly. And then it gets paired together in your muscles. So you think about sex, immediately you think pain, and then what do your muscles do? Yep, because they're thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to hurt. So pain and sex get paired in your mind and your muscles. And with the mind and muscle piece, it's helpful to have a sex therapist on board to help you disconnect these two. And we'll talk a little bit more that, about that in a minute. Um, right now, what I want to go to is the treatment of low sexual desire. So Sarah mentioned this is one of her chief sexual complaints, that she has low desire. And this is most bothersome to her right now. So let's talk about how to treat that with Sarah. So low sexual desire. Patients come in in your office, says she has low sexual desire. First thing you got to do is figure out, well, what desire are you talking about? Because there's actually two types of desire. So one type of desire is called spontaneous, and the other is called willingness. Now let me describe both of these. So spontaneous desire, that's the type of desire where you have that internal drive, that internal craving, and just kind of spontaneously you would say um, you're having a sexual thought or you, you want to initiate sex. So that's that internal drive craving desire. And then the second type of desire, willingness desire or receptive desire, this one doesn't come from an internal drive or an internal craving. Uh, with this one, pretty sexually neutral, like sex really isn't even on your mind, um, but the ingredients are in place that allow you to be willing to be sexual, say if your partner initiated. 
And those ingredients might be, like for Sarah, they would be not feeling pain, and that would be one big ingredient. Uh, having energy might be another ingredient for Sarah. For other women, it would be uh, feeling calm, feeling relaxed. So those ingredients are different for different women, but whatever those ingredients are for you, they're in place. Let's say your partner initiates, and you're like, huh, you know, I wasn't thinking of having sex, but yeah, I'd be willing. So you've got spontaneous desire, and you've got willingness desire. Sounds like this is familiar for many people. Um, so patient comes in your office, says that she has low sexual desire, figure out which desire is she talking about. She may be talking about both of these, but you need to be clear. And then you want to look at the multifactorial etiology. So with any sexual health concern, but specifically with low desire, there are typically multiple factors that play into it. And to treat low desire, you need to figure out what are all these factors that are impacting the low desire. I mean, cancer and fatigue is going to be a big one for Sarah in addition to the pain, but I'm sure there are others. So what are all these different factors that are playing into low, des low desire? And once you figure that out, once you kind of have that blueprint, then you want to tackle as many of these factors as possible, and that's going to be able to maximize her desire. And when I'm talking about maximizing desire, you're not going to be able to help Sarah maximize her spontaneous desire. So if you think about spontaneous desire having like a gas tank, most of the gas in that gas tank for spontaneous desire is hormones. Um, and for Sarah, her hormones are shut down. She doesn't have gas in this gas tank. Uh, so spontaneous desire is not something you're going to be able to impact. And even if Sarah were to get on systemic hormone therapy or even local hormone therapy, that does not put, that puts just a small drop in that gas tank. It puts nothing like the original gas that she had in there. So you can't impact spontaneous. You can, however, help her with that willingness desire. And the help you can give her is trying to figure out what ingredients need to be in place. You kind of have a new sexual normal now that you're surviving this cancer. So now, based on your life, what ingredients need to be in place? Because they're probably different than the ingredients that you needed before. So you're only going to be able to impact this willingness desire. OK, so this biopsychosocial model of sexual function outlines the four areas that you really need to be asking about when Sarah comes in your office. So you want to ask about physiological factors that could be impacting her sexual function, her low desire. Medications are a really common one that are impacting Sarah. Uh, her hormones, she doesn't have that gas in the tank. General urinary syndrome of menopause, there's pain there. Illness, the cancer, she's exhausted because of the cancer treatments. So these are going to be some of the, the main physiological factors impacting her desire. Then you want to look at the psychological emotional piece. Uh, anxiety and depression are the two uh, mental health pieces that Sarah is reporting, which makes sense because of what she's going through. We know that anxiety and depression are the two mood states that take the biggest hit on sexual desire. Because uh, if you're super anxious, your body's in flight, flight or fight mode. It's not in, hey, I'm just going to relax and have some sex right now mode. You've got to be calm and relaxed to have sex, not fight or flight. And if you're depressed, uh, you're having difficulty feeling enjoyment and pleasure. And that's what sex often is, enjoyment and pleasure. Sarah's also struggling with loss of fertility, body image. Interpersonal relationships, so you want to see how the relationship is. You want to ask Sarah about how her relationship is with her husband. Uh, Sarah wasn't reporting any difficulties in the relationship, but lots of couples I see will report some discord uh, during cancer treatment because they're not quite sure how to navigate this. And if there's relationship discord, like if you don't really like your partner because maybe your partner's not supporting you during this time, you're probably not going to want to be sexual with your partner. And then finally, sociocultural influences. Um, so a lack of sex education, or maybe there's a conflict with religious, personal, or family values, or the societal taboo. Uh, Sarah wasn't reporting any of these. But these are the four areas that you want to check in and ask your patient about if they're reporting a sexual health concern, especially low desire. OK, so for Sarah, uh, one of the things we told Sarah, we talked to Sarah about, and you could tell your patient about, is this difference between spontaneous uh, and willingness desire, or, or receptive desire, and how when you don't have that gas in the tank, because of maybe cancer treatment, or because of aging, so postmenopausal women don't have that gas in the tank, that spontaneous desire decreases. You still have willingness desire, though, so it's about capitalizing on this willingness desire. So you're setting up realistic expectations for Sarah about which desire uh, she should be working toward or looking forward to, talking with her about what ingredients need to be in place. And a big piece of that is that sexual activity is going to need to be planful. If the desire you're mostly working with is this willingness receptive desire, which requires those ingredients to be in place, it's kind of like sexual activity becomes cooking a meal. 
if you want to cook a nice big meal, you can't just walk in the kitchen and say, I'm going to make chicken Kiev. Like, you have to have chicken in the fridge, and you've got to have all those ingredients. So you've got to have the ingredients in place, which likely means you're going to have to have to be more planful during sexual activity. And lots of couples have difficulty with this because of the societal stigma that, well, good sex has to be spontaneous, right? Not true. Good sex can definitely be planful. Giving your patient to permission to plan to kind of combat some of those society uh, stereotypes. And then talking about the importance of emotional intimacy as a motivator for sexual desire, for willingness desire. So let me describe this pictorially. And I'll come back here so I can use the, the arrow. OK, so this is the uh, sexual response cycle for women. Uh, about a third of women endorse this cycle. There are a couple other cycles, but about a third of women endorse this cycle. Women who are older, who have chronic illness, uh, cancer, are going to be more likely to, to endorse this cycle. So how, let me describe this because it's pretty, it's pretty uh, chaotic. Um, so here's the, the sexual response circle. And there's two ways you can jump into this cycle. So one way you can jump into this cycle is with this spontaneous sexual drive. And we know with Sarah, she doesn't have gas in the tank. Uh, her hormones just aren't there. So she doesn't have gas in the tank to have that spontaneous drive. So it's probably not going to be the driver for her jumping into her sexual response cycle. So we'll kind of cross that one out. Then the second way you can get in this cycle is less of a jump and kind of more of a crawl. That's where this willingness comes in. So you're willing to be receptive to sexual stimuli. And sexual stimuli might be your partner initiating sexual activity. So let's say you're willing, where'd you go? You're willing, your partner initiates sexual activity. As long as biologically and psychologically everything's going well, so that anxiety is not too high, that depression's not too high, um, biologically there's not all that pain then you're going to experience sexual arousal. After arousal, on the coattails of that comes desire. So arousal is that physiological sexual response, vaginal lubrication, blood flow to the genitals. Desire is that more cognitive motivation, I want to have sex. So arousal comes first, then desire, then emotional and physical satisfaction, which may be orgasm or may be other types of pleasure that you experience during sexual activity. And then this leads to emotional intimacy, so feeling close to your partner, which then leads you to seek out and be receptive toward future sexual stimuli, and then the cycle keeps going. So there's two things I want you to take from this pretty complicated picture here. The first thing is, the whole reason I brought up this slide was this emotional intimacy piece. Emotional intimacy is a big motivator for women to get into this sexual response cycle. And if emotional intimacy isn't there, that closeness you feel with your partner, if that's not there, that's a big break in the cycle. The cycle is going to stop turning. The second thing I want you to take from this, uh, which is pretty interesting, is that sexual arousal uh, for women like Sarah, and actually we know for about two-thirds of women, sexual arousal, that's that physiological body response, comes before sexual desire. So that means that the body has to get on board first, and then that more cognitive desire of like, oh, maybe I do want to have sex, that comes second for lots of women. Okay, so a lot of information, but let's say you've got Sarah in your office. How in the world do you talk about all of this with her? Well, there's a super simple model. It's kind of sex therapy for the non-sex therapist, and it's called Plicit. Um, so it's a basic sex therapy model for the non-sex therapist because most people with sexual problems don't need an intensive course of therapy. You can really treat them right in your office. So I want to talk about Plicit uh, using the sexual pain. We're going to go back to the sexual pain because we didn't have time. We didn't talk a bunch about that. OK, so Plicit, it starts with permission. So many sexual problems are caused by anxiety, guilt feelings, inhibitions. Simply giving permission for your patient to do what they're already doing or maybe what they want to do can alleviate a lot of unnecessary suffering. So how might you give permission to Sarah? Well, here's an example. So again, she's coming in saying, it's too painful to have sex. I have no interest in sex whatsoever. I'm only talking about this to you because it's a problem for my husband. So here's what you might say to Sarah in your office to give her permission. No wonder you don't have any interest in sex. It hurts. You do not have to have painful sex. And that's really important because we know from the research, lots of women who are experiencing pain during sexual activity continue to have painful sexual activity. In fact, that uh, patient that Dr. Fabian mentioned, she was continuing, the one who um, 
couldn't even sit down. I mean, she it was uh, like literally she was just raw, right? She was continuing to have penile vaginal penetration with her partner despite the pain that she was in. So it is really powerful as a provider to give your patient permission to not have to have painful sexual activity. So that's the first piece, permission. Okay, so plicit, limited information. So permission, limited information. Often, it's enough to just give correct information to restore sexual functioning. So that might be describing that sexual response cycle that I just described, talking about anatomy and physiology, the effects of aging, the effects of cancer, medications, uh, radiation, chemotherapy. So just providing some basic limited information. So what information might you give Sarah if she's in your office? Stop having painful sex, because the more painful sex you have, the more pain and sex will be connected and then the less likely you'll be to increase your sexual desire. So again, stop having painful sex. Specific suggestions to give Sarah. Um, so you could talk with her about seeing a gynecologist or a women's health specialist uh, to evaluate if she does have GSM or if she has genital graft versus host disease, which we won't talk about in our talk today, but could talk a little bit about in the Q&A. Um, so you might wanna refer her to a specialist. You might wanna suggest lubrication, as Dr. Fabian mentioned, water-based and silicone, quick recap. Water-based, not as slippery. Silicone, much more slippery. However, if a partner, a uh, heterosexual couple, if the male partner has erectile dysfunction uh, issues, don't want to give them silicone because it's way too slippery. There's not enough friction. Okay, so specific suggestions for Sarah. Penetration is not the only sexual activity. There are other non-painful sexual activities that you can engage in to try to maintain that intimacy. So in our clinic, uh, we actually give couples a sexual menu. So we have put together a, a double-sided sexual menu of all different non-vaginally penetrative sexual activities. And at the top of that menu is a rating scale. So one, I do not want to do this activity. And five, I would love to do this. So what we'll do is we see a couple in our office um, and I'll give them, uh, give them each a sexual menu and I'll say, go in your separate corners and rate your willingness to do all these different activities. And then I'll have them come back together and compare their ratings. And everything they've rated really highly that they'd be willing to do, that becomes their new sexual menu. So it really takes the pressure off of penile vaginal penetration. It takes the pressure off of that painful sexual activity. So many other sexual activities to do. It's a large menu. Um, another thing you can talk about with Sarah is that given that desire is more receptive now, are there ways to increase emotional intimacy in your relationship? Again, emotional intimacy is a main motivator. Or are there ways to be more planful about sex? And then finally, back to that plicit model. So you got permission, limited information, uh, specific suggestions, and now intensive therapy. If you feel like Sarah needs more, uh, more help than you can provide, it may be referring Sarah to perhaps uh, the Women's Health Clinic at Mayo Clinic. We would love to take your referrals. Uh, sex therapy, and we have some, uh, if, you, if you have copies of the slides, at the end of the slide deck, we have uh, the website you go to to find referrals for sex therapists. But if you don't have copies of the slides, email us and we'll give you the information. Uh, couple therapy, pelvic physical therapy, so these would be the people you might want to refer out into the community for more intensive therapy. Now Sarah is uh, a patient that I saw. I saw her with her partner. Um, oh, let me back up for a second. I'm getting, I'm getting too excited. Um, so with intensive therapy, let's say you do want to refer this patient. Most important thing if you're going to refer a patient out is to validate, validate, validate her sexual concerns. We know that patients uh, assume that their provider is going to dismiss their sexual health concerns. They're embarrassed to bring them up and they think they're going to be dismissed. So if this patient was willing to tell you about it, validate, validate, validate. You don't want them to think you're referring them elsewhere because you're just farming them out to somebody else. So to validate, you want to say, your sexual health is important. I'd like to refer you to someone who specializes in the treatment of sexual health concerns. So this is important. I know exactly who can help you. Okay, so back to the treatment that I actually did with Sarah. I did some couples therapy with Sarah and her partner. We talked about increasing sexual health communication between both of them. I had them do those sexual menus. Um, I put them on a penetrative, what I call sex embargo. No penetrative sexual activity, nothing painful. The only way to break the pairing between pain and sex is to stop having painful sex. So penetrative sex embargo, they did the sexual menu, and we talked about how intimacy is a lot more than sex. It's a lot more than penile vaginal penetration. And Sarah really learned to kind of define, she and her partner learned to kind of define and accept this new normal, at least this new normal for now. 
Uh, and we also talked about grieving the loss of fertility as well. That's where the depression was coming in. And overall strategies for mood management, like some basic cognitive behavioral therapy. So Sarah's treatment outcome, I can manage this one day at a time. I realize that this is my new normal. Now I'm gonna pass this over to Dr. Fabian to talk about Kelly. Okay, I'm not gonna do an interpretive dance, but. <laughs> oh, whoops, back to Kelly. Okay, so Kelly is the second patient we're gonna talk about. Her complaint was, I can't even look at my breasts, let alone let my husband look. I haven't let him touch me since my surgery. She's 46, she's a heterosexual married woman. She has stage two breast cancer and had both breasts removed. So let's talk about sexual health and breast cancer. So she's undergone a surgery, she's had both breasts removed, she's dealing with the physical changes. A lot of women who have had mastectomy um, complain of changes in sensation of the breast even with reconstruction. There's chemotherapy. Um, the chances of menopause with chemotherapy increase significantly after the age of 35. And 40 over 40% of women age 40 become amenorrheic. Now that's nothing that you can count on in terms of contraception, but just to let you know that the likelihood of uh, menopause induced by chemotherapy increases significantly after the age of 35. Tamoxifen, so let's talk about the medications that can affect sexual functioning. So tamoxifen is an estrogen antagonist to the breast. It's a weak agonist for the uterus, but it's neutral to the vagina. In contrast, however, we have the aromatase inhibitors like anastrozole, letrozole, and exemestane. Those block estrogen production and really cause significant vaginal dryness, dyspareunia, decreased sexual desire, and a lot of vasomotor symptoms. So the aromatase inhibitors are, have a much greater impact on sexual function. Also think about the psychological impact. So we talk about all the physical impact, but you've got to remember, as Dr. Rula has been talking about, that the psychological impact can be quite significant for these women. So back to Kelly. So her chief complaints were, I look awful. She said, I don't blame him for not wanting to touch me. My breasts used to be such a big part of our sex life. I'm having miserable hot flashes and night sweats since chemotherapy, and I'm not sleeping, and I'm really exhausted. Sex is uncomfortable, I'm so dry. So we have a lot of different things that we need to address for her. So let's think about the treatment goals for Kelly. What, what do we wanna take care of for her? So we're thinking about non-hormonal vasosymptom management. We don't wanna use a, a hormone, systemic hormone therapy for her given her history of breast cancer. We need to manage the vaginal dryness and sexual discomfort. We need to address her issues with her poor body image and the change in the sexual dynamic that she's experienced with her partner. So let's talk about non-hormonal vasomotor symptom management first. So when we think about this, there are many categories of things that we can consider. Lifestyle management, cognitive behavioral therapy, mind-body techniques, non-prescription treatments, non-hormonal prescription treatments, and hormone therapy we're gonna take off the table for her. So when we talk about non-hormonal treatments of vasomotor symptoms, you have to remember that the placebo effect is about 30%. So if I gave everyone in the room a sugar pill for vasomotor symptoms, they're gonna get about 30% better. So any, any menopausal treatment has to be better than a 30% response rate to be determined to be effective. Lifestyle modifications um, include stress management techniques paced respirations, and Dr. Rulo was telling me about a Mayo Clinic app called Meditation. Yeah, there's, Mayo, there's a Mayo Clinic Meditation app, it's $2.99. Um, it's really neat, so you can choose a five minute paced respiration program or a 15 minute paced respiration program. Uh, but they did research on what is the amount of time uh, that is most effective for inhale and exhale, and so when you get this app, you get a little sound, boom, and that's when you inhale, and then boom, and that's when you exhale. So it shows you, it has you pace your inhale and exhale. And it's super helpful. It's really helpful like for me with patients. I had a patient the other day who was really stressed out and was crying so hard she was like, <gasps> like couldn't even catch her breath. And I'm like, we're gonna do some paced respiration breathing right now. And just turn on the app and just boom. So super helpful. So um, they've shown that for pace respirations, it can actually make the hot flash peak lower and end sooner, so it can be helpful. Dressing in layers, of course, um, using wicking materials, uh, not using fan, that kind of thing. Avoidance of triggers, so caffeine, alcohol, tobacco are known triggers. Emotions are also known triggers. Uh, so avoiding these things if possible. 
Cognitive behavioral therapy, while that may improve your reaction to the hot flashes, you don't get so freaked out by them, it's not gonna improve the frequency, but it can be helpful for women because it helps them be less distressed by it. Phytoestrogens, so we're talking about soy. No conclusive evidence out there that soy supplements effectively reduce frequency or severity of vasomotor symptoms. However, there's, there's more research to be done there. It may be that we need higher doses than have been studied so far. Um, it may mean that some women have a genetic predisposition to be able to respond to it and others do not. So I think there's more, more to the story yet that we have not heard. Acupuncture, so the conclusion with a Cochrane review recently done was insufficient evidence to determine whether or not it works for vasomotor symptoms. Um, however, a recent interesting study came out and compared uh, sham acupuncture and acupuncture versus placebo, and both sham acupuncture and acupuncture were successful. So uh, in other words, uh, sham acupunctures, they still use needles, they just put them in the wrong place. Um, and interestingly, both acupuncture and sham acupuncture were helpful. And I will tell you anecdotally that we do use acupuncture in our clinic for vasomotor symptoms, and I have several patients that swear by it. Black cohosh, over-the-counter supplement, um, brand name Remy Femin, insufficient evidence to support the use for menopausal symptoms, and it has been associated with a few cases of liver failure, so I generally avoid that one. Exercise, so the studies regarding exercise and hot flashes are inconsistent. However, what do you have to lose? It's cost-effective, it relieves stress, it improves your mood, it improves other somatic symptoms. Um, enhances quality of life, improves sexual function, it can re, um, impede weight gain and muscle loss, so really you've got nothing to lose there. Let's talk about SSRIs and SNRIs. So they're, they're, whereas placebo is 30%, this is worth about 40 to 50% reduction in hot flashes, whereas hormone therapy is about 90%. So to put it in perspective, it helps a little bit, it's a modest effect. Usual side effects profile, so SSRIs are associated with sexual dysfunction, so you have to keep that in mind. We also don't know what the long-term effects to the brain are for having a woman on SSRIs for a long period of time. Um, these are most useful for women who can't take hormone therapy for one reason or another, so our breast cancer patient. And you have to be cautious in breast cancer survivors because it's a CYP2D6 inhibitor, especially paroxetine. So gabapentin and pregabalin are another one. They're kind of in the 40 to 50% effective range, um, moderate effect. The side effects are dizziness, fatigue, and somnolence. So when I'm dosing this, I often weight the dose at night so it can actually help with sleep. Clonidine we used to use in the past, but it really is not, a quite, it's not as effective, so we don't use it too much anymore. And sleeping medications. So while they're not going to reduce vasomotor symptoms, it can get a woman through the night and help improve sleep. So examples, um, Paxil or paroxetine is now marketed as Brisdell. It's the first FDA-approved non-hormonal treatment for hot flashes just came out in the last year, and their marketing is a 7.5 milligram tablet. Uh, effects are, keep in mind here, we're using low doses, 37.5 to 75. If it's not helped at that dose, it's not going to. No use and keep going up on the dose. Pristique, 50 to 100, Lexapro 10 to 20, gabapentin, Again, low dose, 300 to 900 milligrams a day in divided doses, pregabalin 75 twice a day. So again, for Kelly, let's talk about management of vaginal dryness and sexual discomfort. So treating genitourinary syndrome of menopause, don't forget the moisturizer. So you're gonna have her use it every day or every other day, something like Replens or one of the other ones. Lubricants for sexual activity, water-based and silicone, and remember, have a couple of these in mind that you can advise your patients on. Uh, sexual activity itself, self-stimulation and vibrators, we actually normalize this for women. Over 50% of women are using these now, and we actually kind of write it as a prescription for them to use a vibrator. It helps stimulate blood flow to the area, it helps with sexual functioning. And we actually carry them in the Mayo store downstairs, and um, Jordan and I were talking about this, but we've been carrying them for probably a couple of years now, and it was an argument to get them to carry them in the Mayo store initially until they couldn't keep them stocked. And now they, they really understand that it's a good thing. So we now have a, a menu that we have in the women's health clinic where we can just check off things and they can take it down to the store and they'll fill it for them and bring it up to the counter so they don't even have to go look for it. 
So vaginal estrogen in breast cancer survivors. There's no data suggesting increased risk of recurrence with local vaginal estrogen therapy. Now, the duration of the studies is limited, but thus far there is no evidence that it increases risk of recurrence. The vaginal ring and tablet we know are associated with transiently elevated serum estrogen levels. And in theory, even small increases in estradiol levels may render aromatase inhibitors less effective. Um, so what we do in our clinic is we go over other options first. We talk about vaginal moisturizers and lubricants, and if that just isn't doing it, we talk with the oncologist and see how comfortable they are with letting us use some vaginal estrogen. We also take into account other things, for instance, the um, stage of the breast cancer and how far out they are from diagnosis and how their, the quality of life of the patient is and what the patient's desires are, and really it comes down to a balance of, of quality of life. For instance, my patient recently who literally could not sit down, her quality of life was so affected, she was like, I, I've got to use a little bit of estrogen to take care of this because my, my quality of life is so miserable. So treatment goals for Kelly again. Let's talk about the poor body image and the change in sexual dynamic, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Ruo. Okay. Okay, so to familiarize you with Kelly, I can't even look at my breasts, let alone let my husband look. I haven't let him touch me since my surgery. So we're gonna go through the Plicit model again with Kelly. So imagine you've got her in your office, and this is what she's telling you. So permission. Many women learn to dissociate from their body for protection during cancer treatment. I mean, think about during cancer treatment, radiation, uh, surgery, being poked and prodded, you've got all these doctors looking at you. Um, women really often learn to kind of dissociate, kind of separate themselves from their body to get through that time. But then once uh, all the cancer treatments are over, it's like, how do you get yourself checked back in with your body? So giving her permission, saying, yes, this happens. And that's where later sex therapy can come into place to help her reconnect with her body. Uh, limited information that you would give Kelly. What we see in the mirror is distorted by our pain and fear. Working through that pain and fear can help you reconnect with your body. Specific suggestions. Your husband needs to, be, needs to know how you feel because he will be a part of the solution. So with Kelly, she didn't want to talk about this at all with her husband. Uh, any discussion about her breasts were off limits. They'd, they developed kind of this avoidant dynamic where this whole area of her body was not being talked about, touched, looked at. They could, were completely avoiding. Uh, and he needed to be a part of this. She needed to share with him what she was experiencing and her worries and her fears so he could help her. Intensive therapy, individual therapy or bibliotherapy, that's reading a book and bringing it in with your therapist, can help you reconnect with your body. I can refer you to therapists in the community and helpful books. So validating her concern and then giving some referrals. So these are a couple really excellent books. The first one is the Body Image Workbook. It is not specifically for cancer survivors. Uh, it's about body image in general, but it is really helpful for anyone uh, suffering with body image concerns. And then Breast Cancer Husband. So this is great for uh, couples, uh, for the, the male partner in the couple where the wife ex is experiencing breast cancer. Um, so psychological treatment for Kelly. When I worked with Kelly, we worked a lot on body image. So here are some of the things I talked about with her. Bodies change with age. You know, we give our partners grace for those changes. How is this any different? So I really asked her, has your husband's body changed in the 20-some years you've been married? Has it changed at all? Well, yeah, you know, he's got a little, little bit more of a belly and some love handles. And, and how do you feel about that? Oh, fine. I love him. I still find him attractive. Huh. And you don't think that he's feeling the same way about you? You give him grace, but you don't think he gives you grace? Um, so really kind of challenging the ideas that she has. Uh, talking about embracing the health that her body continues to have, so developing some gratitude. Opening up that partner communication, getting her and her husband to talk about uh, her breasts, and then just more couples therapy to address each of these issues. Sensate focus exercise, these are kind of a gold standard in sex therapy. So what these are, these are developed by Masters and Johnson. Um, if anyone's ever seen the Showtime show, Masters of Sex. So Masters and Johnson, they are real researchers. These exercises were developed by them about the 1960s. And what these are is these are gradual exercises that start with just sensual touching, no sexual activity, and then gradually over about four phases lead toward uh, penile vaginal penetration. I had Kelly and her partner go through sensate focus exercises, and I mostly wanted them to focus on phase one and phase two to start 
touching again. So in phase one and phase two, which is just sensual touching, what I'll tell the couple is sex embargo. Um, no sex, period. You two have to agree to a sex embargo for at least a month. And then at least once a week, you engage in these 30-minute touching exercises. So for 30 minutes, uh, 15 minutes, she touches him. 15 minutes, he touches her all over their body. Typically, uh, the couple's fully nude. With Kelly, she did not feel comfortable feeling fully nude. She wanted to wear a t-shirt because she wasn't ready to look at her breasts or let him look at her breasts. So we kind of tailored it for her. First, she wore a t-shirt, then wore a bra, and then was able to let her husband look and touch her breasts in a sensual, non-sexual way. Let's take away any pressure for sex. So just this sensual touching got her reconnected with her body, what it felt like to be touched, and got her partner reconnected with her body because they had been avoiding for a long time. So in the end, with treatment, here's what Kelly said. I can't believe we waited this long to touch each other. I wish we would have done this a year ago. So take home points for our talk. Ask routinely about sexual function in your uh, patients who are cancer survivors. Just pick one question. So my favorite question is, do you have any sexual health concerns? Just pick one question. Manage the menopausal symptoms that your patient's reporting and address sexual function, both the medical and the psychological aspects. You can just follow that plicit model in session and refer as needed. Thank you. So we'll take any questions you guys have. Scare me. You two are ladies, and this is about uh, female or ladies, but is there a men's counterpart at the male clinic that deals with male sexual dysfunction concerns? Great question. Or do you question. do both? Um, so yes and no. Uh, yes, we have a urologist, uh, Dr. Landon Trost. Uh, he is a sexual medicine specialist. Uh, so any men with sexual health concerns will see Dr. Trost. And then I work with both men and women. So I mostly work with women, but Dr. Trost will send me the men that he sees for their sexual health concerns. And of course, I work with couples. Great question. Anything else? Oh, come on. I know you guys have some questions. I just heard something on the radio about uh, a new product for female libido. I wonder if you, I missed the first half of the lecture, so I'm always reluctant to ask a question uh, for fear. No, that that's you a good question. It. That's the drug is glimansurin, um, and it's a 5-HT1A agonist, antagonist. I can't remember exactly which, but um, yes, it, uh, it didn't make it through the FDA on the first pass, and it was just resubmitted. Um, it has been shown to successfully increased sexually satisfying events for women from about two per month to about four per month. Um, you know, while it's not going to be the end all be all because as we talk about, most of the time sexual dysfunction in women has m more than one cause and probably more like five or six different things that are impacting it. So it's not gonna be the Viagra for women, but it would certainly be nice to have some more options uh, to treat women for sexual dysfunction. I, th I think women deserve that. And so. it, didn't, it didn't get through the FDA because their question was, well, from two sexually satisfying events to, to four, four events, it only bumped you up to two events, nah, I don't think that's enough. But that was a 50% increase. And what, what they didn't really get at was the sexual satisfaction piece. So how did women feel about that? And, and in the end, they, they thought it was a really important increase and they felt it was valuable. So that's why they're going back to the FDA again and we're gonna try again. And there are other drugs in the pipeline too, by the way, there are some on-demand, um, Liberdo and Liberdose are also in the uh, pipeline and they are a combination. One is uh, Boost Bar and uh, testosterone and the other one is Sildenafil and testosterone, and they would be used on demand, so right before sexual activity. So there are some things that are out there that, that might work. Yes? One of you, or both of you have talked about you don't have to have vaginal penile penetration, but you had your little quiz of book, which you never told us what's in it. Is that- oh, Are you talking about the sexual menu? Yes. Um, what's anyone? that about, or is that published, or is, you got- it, it's not published, um, oh, so know, it? It, it's, it was created from a variety, a lot of Google searching to find a bunch of different activities. Um, so the menu is all, I know, I love my job. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about it. 
so it is, <laughs> it's all non-vaginally penetrative sexual activity, so non-vaginally penetrative, and it gradually gets more adventurous. So it starts just with hand-holding, kissing, and I think the last one is like clamps. Um, and I, patients will see this and go, what? And I'm like, look, there's a rating scale up top. You can say no on the clamps. This is all, there's just ideas. Um, it is not online. But if anyone wants a copy of the menu, shoot email me her. shoot me an email. Uh, so I'm the oh I thought it was up there. I'm Jordan Rulo Jordan at Mayo.edu. Shoot me an email. I'm happy to send you the sexual menu. Actually, couples like to fill it out. It's kind of a fun activity because it really does um, make them talk about it again. So they fill it out independently and then compare. And it's uh, I've had couples there who are like, oh, my mother's staying with us, maybe not tonight, you know, but we'll do, we'll do it maybe next week or something. But they actually kind of have fun doing it. What about breast reconstruction? Does that have any positive effects? Breast reconstruction? Um, well, positive effects on body image? Or I didn't hear that. On uh, the sexual relationship afterwards, I'm thinking of the effect on the husband more than the, the wife. It really depends. It depends a lot on how it's impacted sensation. At least that's uh, in my clinical experience, what I've heard from patients. So there are some patients who say that their breasts and their breast sensation was a really important part of their sexual activity with their partner. So no matter how beautiful their breasts might look after reconstruction, if that sensation is not there, their sexual satisfaction has significantly decreased. But if it's a woman who their breasts have really never been uh, a big part of their sexual activity, then you know reconstruction's fine. Um, and sometimes it may enhance sexual pleasure because they're more um, they're happy with how their breasts look. Well, thank you very much, guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having us.